All right, hello everyone and welcome to the Second Swing, both YouTube channel and Facebook page right now. We've got a very special guest joining us today. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties there for a little bit, but we are live finally. We've got things figured out. We've got JP Harrington joining us today. Um, one of the finest club builders in the world. Um, and if you've seen on our page a little bit here on Second Swing, um, we've got some new wedges available at Second Swing. We partnered with JP here. So um, JP, first of all, just want to thank you for joining us today. I know it's a very busy time for you. So thank you for making the time to join us today. And how are things going for you? How is 2021 going for you? No, it's going well. And uh, first, thanks for having me on. I uh, appreciate it and uh, really looking forward to this partnership that we're creating right now with the JP Premier. Um, it's been a busy, busy first year uh, with the new launch, um, but it's going really well. Performance is outstanding, product is great. Really excited about it. Awesome, awesome. And so I've got a first-hand look at these wedges. Um, we'll, we'll get to JP Premier and then JP Camber later on. Um, these things are, are stunning, let me tell you. So for the viewers, um, stick around and we'll kind of show some images and things like that of these wedges. But first, JP, I want to get just your background in golf. How did you get into club building and uh, kind of what struck you about, you know, building golf clubs and the game of golf at an early age? Yeah, well, actually, I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin, not too far away from Minneapolis, Minnesota, across the border, uh, Ellsworth, Wisconsin. They had a small nine hole Ellsworth Country Club. And so sure. uh, as a kid, my parents took me out there uh, as like a family outing. They weren't golfers, but I was uh, into baseball quite a bit growing up. And I remember, you know, my dad made me tee off in the ladies tee with a nothing but irons. And the first swing I hit was a four iron. I, I pulled it way left, but I hit it really flush. So uh, there you go. pretty much after that, it, it kind of, I got the bug and then they, you know, they gave me a, got me a, a little mem summer membership. I used to ride my bike out there, get, you know, play a lot of golf, you know, um, with some friends by myself and then high school came, uh, started to get on the golf team. I take it a little more seriously. Um, and, you know, played, got, was able to get to the state tournament and things like that. Um, as our, our high school team actually won state. Uh, 2000 wow. and then and then after after uh high school i ended up going to st cloud state university um getting okay. general business credits and then you know, after two years you have to decide and declare a major i still didn't really know what i wanted to do but i always you know had a strong passion for golf um i was one of those kids that would go to the golf store with my stepdad all the time you know um i remember in my bag and um in high school, I had the, you know some Ben Hogan Apex blades at a Betonardi BB2 sure, SS yeah. putters. So I was I was into the into the equipment side of side of golf, uh, and so after kind of figuring out, I didn't really know what I wanted to major in at St. Cloud State. So I did some research. I found the professional golf management program at Arizona State. So then I transferred into Arizona State uh, to that PGM okay. program, where you know a lot of the people coming in might be interested in being. Uh, a director of golf or a head pro through that program. Um, but I thought it'd be a way in to the equipment side of golf. I remember um, driving down, you know, and wondering what I wanted to get in the equipment side of golf. I didn't really know how that would that would unfold. Um, so I went to the program. Fortunate for me um, in Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, in that time period of, you know, early 2000s, 2004, 2005, it was when Hot Sticks Golf in Scottsdale, Arizona was really making a, a move on that high-end custom fitting mm -hmm. um, to the to golfers. And so through the internship program at Arizona State, um, I was able to get an internship building golf clubs. I uh, never built golf clubs before Hot Sticks, so I learned you know the art of building golf clubs from drivers to, to putters, uh, tearing out shafts and building it to the specs. Uh, from the custom fitting and so I just I really like that so I focused and ultimately did all my internships uh, with hot six uh, going you know full-time school full-time uh, internship type of deal because I really enjoyed it um, and then at hot six they had uh, a little grinding room with uh, some Burking grinders a Bridgeport vertical knee mill where they did uh, custom wedges and putters and so after I kind of got um, well versed in the art of club building, you know, I thought well, I'd like to try that custom wedge stuff. So I got in. I remember uh, 
this guy named Trapper Steinley was the the guy that was um, doing the custom wedges. Ultimately, doing like heel toe grinds, removing the heel and the toe from existing manufacturer's product, whether it's Callaway, Titleist, Wolf, uh, even what have you. And then because you're removing that weight uh, through the grinding process, you need to get that weight back somehow. So they did uh, tungsten inlays to get that weight back. And so okay. that's kind of how it all started there. Um, you know, uh, once I, I got on the, the grinder and start, started to throw some sparks, I really, really liked it. So I just really tried to focus on that. And then by the time I was able to do my first custom project alone, turned out pretty good. And then I just kept volunteering for those custom projects, uh, whether it was wedges and putters, ultimately at that time. And then from there, um, Mark Timms uh, was, a, was a founder of Hot Six Golf. And he started another company called Cool Clubs in Scottsdale, Arizona. So then mm -hmm. after Hot Sticks, I went to Cool Clubs and, and headed up the custom design studio. And that's where, you know, Mark really allowed me to um, hone in my craft a bit, get a little bit more um, aesthetically ori oriented with some stamps and some paint fill and some unique finishes to those, again, those modified existing manufacturer's wedges. Um, so, then, yeah, just kind of focused on that. I saw... I saw, you know, a need in there. And I remember actually at Hot Sticks one time, uh, Aaron Baddeley had came in with a set of McGregor irons that had a real boxy heel and a boxy toe on there. They're already a little heavy. So we had some room to work with. So he came in and um, we did some grinds on the, like the three, six and nine iron after hours type of deal. He went and uh, that was like a Monday. He went on Tuesday, hit him called me up, say, you know, I'd like you to match the rest of the set. So I did that, gave it to him Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, through the end of the week, he practiced with him, said, hey, you know, JP, I'm going to put these in my bag next week. So ended up first week in the bag, he got his first PGA Tour win. So that was one of those oh, defining wow. moments for me that like, wow, you know, what a surreal experience that was. And so from there, I said, you know, I just really wanted to focus uh, on that. I found that space within the wedge segment. Um, and, and really started to focus in on wedges after that. Um, after Cool Clubs, I decided to um, move back to my hometown area, actually in, in Wisconsin in 2009. Uh, I moved into, my dad has a greenhouse business in the, you know, the countryside of Ellsworth, Wisconsin, uh, pole shed. He, I kind of cleared out a corner of the pole shed, got a small, small business loan, bought some equipment set up shop uh, in the spring of 2009 um, and with the ultimate goal of creating my own wedge line you know and, and at that mm -hmm. point I didn't really know how that was how to really do that I just was kind of going after it um, at that time I was also had a little partnership with Mira where I would get some Mira um, wedge heads that were overweight and then I grind them down and then I was able to luckily fortunate enough to utilize a golf WX and my golf spy to post some of my projects uh, that I was doing sure. online and start to build that following for you know, JP golf ultimately. And then, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the winters in Wisconsin and Minnesota, as you know, get pretty cold. Well, that shed yeah. that I was working on, it wasn't insulated. So when November, November came, it was getting pretty chilly. So I ended up moving um, in a garage shop in St. Louis Park Actually, my mom's got in my mom's garage. Um, she had a heated two-car garage, and I put, put all my equipment in, in her garage and ultimately worked there from, you know, 2009 to 2013. And that really allowed me to really focus on my craft. I was able to go to Japan, source some uh, for to ultimately create my line, my own solo line. Um, so that's what I did in that garage until um, 2013. Okay. Wow. And then, so, so this is kind of the origins of really the JP wedges that you kind of went through. You talked about, first of all, that story, by the way, the Aaron Valley story is so cool because I mean, so kind of, you can almost like, I don't want to say take credit for winning a PGA tour, event, but like you, you kind of can because you built the guys. Irons, um, and right away in the bank, he wins. I mean, that, that's kind of like a, that's a fairy tale type story. Yeah, it was, it was really a, you know, it was a real big motivation and a, you know, a real blessing to be able to have that experience at, Kind of early time in my career and then it you know really uh, motivated me to, to go down the rabbit hole mm -hmm. a little bit 
So then is that is that when you realized, yeah, I have a pretty you know, rare, unique talent of building golf clubs? And then is that kind of also like, you know, why you wanted to start your own kind of line or own business? Or maybe where there was a different moment? Or when did you realize that you were like well, really, yeah, really was, good at this? That, you know, I wanted to really focus after that Aaron Bradley uh, experience. Um, and then as I saw, I was doing a lot more custom wedges than I was putters. Um, and so I, can, I said, I looked at the you know, who's out there and the, the ultimate craftsman of the industry, um, like like a Don White from McGregor at that time, and always national custom of the legend ultimately, you know, uh, best grinder in the world in my opinion, um, and a Hall of Famer. Then you look at uh, Bob Bokey, Roger Cleveland, um, what they're doing, um, and it really thought, well, well who's next? You know, like I, I want to try to you know, give my skills up and maybe right. someday I could have my own line and, 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 uh, carry the torch. So, speak. so at the end of the day, you know, we're standing on, everybody's standing on the shoulder of giants. Right. Um, I was able to go to fly out to Don White's, uh, workshop at McGregor for, uh, a, a, a few days and, and watch him and take notes. Um, he was, uh, hand sculpting a set of blades and wedges for a tour player. Um, he taught me how to measure bounce, how to hit a stamp. So I really owe a lot to uh, Don White for that. Mm -hmm. And then you see Scotty Cameron and, and his artistic uh, flair that he was sure. able to bring, you know, ultimately in, to the putter industry. And so, you know, I have a bit of, you know, that artistic side to me, but I also like, you know, that blue collar work with my hands, uh, shaping wedges. So I just kind of took it on my own, my own path and, and uh, like I said, you know, it was ultimately having some of those experiences, seeing the legends in the industry and ultimately thinking, well, you know, I want to do that someday. Mm -hmm. And I was I was poking around on jpgolf.com. Uh, so that's JP's you know website for his wedges for those who are watching and want to check out, check it out and learn some more about, um, you know, his story and whatnot. But I was looking around on there and I saw you said, one in particular thing that stuck out to me was you discovered that some rules of wedge building were made to be broken. So I'd like to get kind of, you know, an explanation on what that means um, and, you know, how you, you know, maybe put that into your work a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of times, you know, the things are, if it's, it's kind of that if it's not broke, don't fix it mentality sometimes. You got, if you look back at, you know, let's say the Cleveland 588, you know, uh, wedges, mm -hmm. that was a, and, well, and even before that, ping, you know, ping wedges. Um, but all again, you got one one solid piece of metal, um, all with a traditional, what I call a traditional leading edge, a uh, real crisp or sharper leading edge. Um, so there's some common threads. And for me, um, I was always a, a, a steep angle of attack in general when I golfed, took a big okay. divot. And, you know, if you, if you don't hit that ball, strike that ball real perfectly and we get a sharp leading edge hit behind the ball last thing you want to do is stick that thing in the ground so right. as i was able to get into sculpting wedges and creating my own design i really focused on on camber and what camber does is um, it resists that leading edge from contacting the ground first it creates a real consistent turf interaction that same that consistency is what a tour player demands every time he knows what's going to happen, gets in and out of that divot. But that same consistency translates to feedback or forgiveness for all golfers. So it's a really unique uh, sole design with, with that camber from the leading edge to the trailing edge to resist that digging, create the t uh, consistent turf interaction while giving you uh, the forgiveness that all golfers really need. And then you couple that with that real aggressive heel toe grind, mm -hmm. um, you know, that I, that I learned at, at hot sticks back in the day. Right. Um, couple that we can hit all the shots and that's the whole goal is to be able to hit all the shots on the golf course from flop shots to knockdowns and things like that. Um, so I really focused on the soul, what that, what, how to create the most efficient turf interaction possible. And so that's what I'm doing with JP camber. Um, then you take that single material, uh, call it, you know, carbon 1025, it's forged 1025 carbon steel or that half 8620, 
that uh, the major manufacturers are doing. Um, and then you look, well, where's the sweet spot on that, right? So if it's a one piece, mm -hmm. um, piece club, you got a, a hosel or that neck that really is a big weapon system to draw that center of gravity uh, more uh, towards, towards, the, towards the heel, right? So with a multiple material, uh, design, I can use tungsten, titanium, uh, epoxy resins and in, in, in ca internal cavities to really fine tune that center of gravity. Um, so it's more towards the sweets or the center of the face where you're going to contact the ball, which is going to give you more energy transfer, feedback, feel, distance control. And so now I'm able to uh, use that technology that's out there with multiple materials um, and really um, um, tune that center of gravity like they're doing on metal woods even and now uh, and, and get that energy transfer uh, towards the middle of the face where you're going to be striking the ball. So you can do that as well as make it very consistent from wedge to wedge um, so that feel is consistent from a gap wedge to a lob wedge and so forth. So I can do that uh, with the multiple materials and ultimately to get this wedge to balance, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, pin. first of all, it sounds like it sounds like you're the guy that I want building my wedges because <laughs> the way you talk, it's like you have every single little detail. You have it so fine tuned, and so I mean that, and then you could, then you could see it when you look at the wedges that I, 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 I was able to get my hands on or my hands on them and my eyes on them and look at them, and it was really cool to to see all that work kind of come together. So. Um, now, so clearly this is all, you know, it's, I, I just, I have to say again, like for the viewers, like you have to check out these wedges. We got them on secondswing.com and also just go to jpgolf.com, learn more about these and look at them. Um, so before we, we'll kind of get into JP Premier and, J, and then again, we'll kind of touch on JP Camber again. Um, I wanted to kind of get your, your uh, perspective on, you know, working with Titleist and doing that um, part of your, that part of your career. So what was that like? Um, going through that experience and um, what did you learn from that, I guess? Well, again, another surreal uh, experience, you know, I had that Aaron battle. He was able to go up through hot sticks mm -hmm. and cool club um, and then garage shop to ultimately to 2013 in which, you know, I got a call out of the, out of the blue uh, from the senior VP of HR. I, I missed the call. I got a voicemail saying, you know, I uh, just wanted to chat, so I figured I better, better, I better return that phone call. <laughs> so uh, basically, that was on, you know, that was on a, that was on a Wednesday, I believe, uh, springtime of 2013, and that following Monday, he's sitting in, sitting in my mom's garage with a stack of papers on me, um, and basically we talked wedges, wedges through the morning. Ultimately, I. I hand ground a wedge for him, had a great day. Um, and ultimately, um, a week later, uh, the senior VP of R&D and, and uh, uh, the CEO, uh, Wally Uline, sitting in my garage. So uh, again, that was like another world world of opportunity that came by. So I ended up in July 2013, packed my bags. Uh, they set me up with a, a really great private you know, garage shop on steroids, you could say, um, and ultimately gave uh, me an opportunity to um, design a JP by Titleist line of wedges. So another uh, dream come true, uh, great experience, great people there, Titleist, and uh, was able to utilize a TPI, Titleist Performance Institute, have a wedge fitting, um, um, experience where I was able to use some high-speed video camera and really get uh, the, a true angle of attack, dynamic loft to ultimately fit these wet, these JP by Titleist wedges uh, to the clientele that came out for these fittings. So I was there until 2018, great experience, five years. And, um, mm -hmm. and then after that, I felt that it was time to, uh, you know, write the next chapter for JP Golf. And, and here we are today. Yeah, so I, I, I was, again, I, I looked through your, um, your website and kind of had the story that you've sort of written on there. The first 50 um, was one of the projects on there that it's almost like you were kind of 
uh, you know, sort of paying tribute to the people that you know were there from the very beginning of of, of JP Golf. So, um, could you explain what that was and kind of what that project you know all entailed and what it meant to you? Yeah, that was a that was a, a unique project. So, I'm out of out of Titleist now, and I I got a workshop. I got some equipment set up. Got a CNC milling machine, all the grinding equipment and, and things like that. Um, I was able to source a, a, well, create a forging, a real raw, oversized forging um, that ultimately gave me a ton of meat on the on the sole. Basically, you can create any any wedge under the sun uh, with this big, heavy, uh, oversized forging. So I got these things in, and I said, well, I should I'd do a project. You know, I should. So I came out with this first 50. Is basically all using my milling machine, I milled the faces, the score lines, the hosels, and then I took it to the grinder from there and then sculpted them, shaped them. Um, mm -hmm. Did 50, 50 pieces, um, a lot of a lot of which went, went to some original clients. Um, and it was a it was a great experience. It allowed me to get back to, you know, that true uh, sculpting a bit, um, get creative uh, and ultimately have another uh, piece in the you know, another chapter to showcase what what I was doing all the while I'm trying to ultimately prepare for this, you know, next line in which the JP Premier came out. So it was a transition uh, time and it was, uh, it was, it was a lot of work, um, but in the end it, it turned out pretty good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned JP Premier um, and that's really what, um, you know, really we're excited about right now is JP Premier. We've got a limited amount um, with us here at Second Swing. Um, and I know we've got some photos we can maybe throw up on screen here, but those things are absolutely stunning. Um, there's you know, a variety of loss or a variety, or a couple of, of bounce options as well that people can choose from right now on the Second Swing website. So tell us about JP Premier, how it started, uh, the construction process. I know you've already detailed a ton of that already, but um, go through that. And really, you know, if, if people are interested in these, what are they going to get um, by, you know, getting a JP Premier Wedge. Right, well, like I said, I, you know, with that first 50 allowed me to sculpt and kind of create, and I had these oversized forgings that I could um, ultimately figure out, well, what, what's my line gonna be? So it all starts with with uh, um, throwing some sparks on the wheel, shaping a wedge, um, getting that sole design just right. Um, got a, a new, um, JP camera sole design, which is patent pending. We're all excited about that. And well, the great thing about Premier is that, you know, um, I'm utilizing CNC milling to produce that sole. So that geometry that I ultimately sculpted and, and got into a CAD system and is now precision milled. So that, ter which equates to that turf interaction. So we want a consistency, 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 and that allows that sole if you get a new one um, to really um, have a, have the same one every time, right? So that's a very important to me right there. So you got the, a forged construction, forge not cast, you know, forge a superior mm -hmm. product that's removing all those, that porosity or air bubbles inside the, the metal. So it's pounding or, and eliminating all those. So you have a real dense, solid metal, which translates to feel and feedback as well. So we start with the highest quality materials um, through testing and all that prototyping, getting the, the sole geometry right the way we want it. We're gonna custom mill that. And then from there, we're gonna get that center of gravity, CG or sweet spot, exactly where we want it. Um, and then we got to hold all those engineering properties consistent while achieving our head weight um, and have something that, you know, we feel is aesthetically pleasing. You know, I like um, the word timeless, right? So if I'm designing something, I want it to be timeless. You know, mm -hmm. if you're going to buy a high-end watch, you don't want to get sick of it uh, after the first year. So um, similar thinking um, as an artist, you know, that's the final thing. You want to, again, hold all those performance properties. It's always performance first, and then then you want to, you know, keep that in mind as you're, you know, designing the aesthetic look of it. So you need to hold all that. So we have that multiple material. The colored uh, is, a, is a forged milled titanium backplate. We got those three signature uh, 
bullets in the toe. And then under the hood, under the hood of that titanium, you have some more uh, tungsten uh, weighting, some, some cavities that are filled with uh, unique resins to help achieve that center of gravity. Um, another cool thing is I can get these things uh, custom head weight uh, from lightweight to heavyweight and anywhere in between to the tightest tolerances in the industry. So easily a half plus or minus a half a gram, which typically, uh, you know, off the rack, a stock wedge, you're looking at plus or minus four grams a lot, which, which an eight gram spread is quite significant. So then you have to use tip mm -hmm. weights and things like that. This, I can get all that weight behind the ball. It's gonna contribute to that energy transfer um, and feel instead of putting a tip weight in the shaft of the uh, tip of the shaft in that hosel, automatically throwing all those engineering properties that work so hard to get. So it's a highly custom. We can do custom head weights. Um, we can do custom custom finish options as well as those, you know, that custom inlaid stainless steel JP badge, which is pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just, you can see the photos now. We're kind of throwing up. Those are, they're stunning. And I think I love the, like, kind of almost like that scraped finish as well on that back plate, which is really cool to look at there, too. So, um, I mean, Appreciate kudos it. to you for putting together these these clubs like this that can have that type of appearance. Because they definitely, it's like, you know, yeah, I, other wedges in the industry, would like, they don't, they don't pop like this. So, but at the same time, you're also, with every little detail, you're, also providing the performance, which is the really cool and unique part of this. So, um, and kind of in more in those details, we talked a little bit, mentioned it before, the, the JP Camber. Um, so a, a kind of another project you're working on. And so we can kind of get that um, image again up on something like traditional wedges versus kind of what you're looking at um, right. with the, you know, the JP Camber. But um, can you maybe explain a little bit more on that um, and maybe explain for the viewers, yeah. you know, what you do kind of differently and more unique compared to maybe that traditional wedge? Yeah, so you'll see that wedge on the right, that's the JP Premier. See the wedge on the left, um, that's just what I call a traditional wedge. Um, it doesn't really matter who may, uh, the right. manufacturer that makes it. Um, it's all you can see. Um, it has a crisper or sharper leading edge, and you can see the arrow on the JP wedge has that more rounded curvature. Now, camber can be confusing, bounce, it all can be confusing right but camber is just mm -hmm. curvature you can, you can replace camber and curvature and uh, replace those words in a sentence and they mean the same thing so that curvature creates that rolled or blunted leading edge area so um, that's going to ensure that that sole contacts the ground first and when it does contact the ground it's not going to stick catch or grab if you hit slightly behind the ball right last thing we want to do is chunk it got a little 30 yard pitch shot and Lay the sod over it, stick the leading edge in the ground that gets onto the green maybe or leaves it short. Uh, what this does is one, it provides that consistent turf interaction when you hit a, a, a pure strike. But let's say you hit a little behind the ball, that leading edge now, that blunt, blunted or rolled leading edge is going to resist catching, snagging, or sticking that leading edge in the ground. It's going to get through the ball and you're going to end up with a shot that's uh, pretty darn close to uh, what what you would have had if you hit it if you hit it flush so that you know traditional leading edge is going to stick grabbing the into the ground going to hit it short you might leave yourself a 30 40 50 footer I'm not even making a green with this if you do that you know you're going to still have a a put a make will put even within five feet a lot of times so um that's one of the very unique things that curvature as i'm pointing as that arrow is it's also kind of ramp ramping into the divot and then ramping out so it, like it gets in the ground and gets right out of there it contains sure. more speed because it has less drag um through impact one of the things that maybe you can relate to is you know when we're sliding in those uh in the the snow hills of the on a on a sled in the winter in minnesota oh, yeah. uh, a lot of the old school sleds remember that red saucer Right? Oh, yeah. Well, that mm -hmm. red softer sled is curved, right? It's like a bottom oh, of a yeah. spoon. And you can lean on that thing. You can go direction, you can lean back with it, go straight. So, what you're doing is a similar thing as you're getting a tangent surface. No edges are catching on that ground. It's going to want to, it's going to want to slide more versus catch uh, through right. that ground. So, taking a div, it's not a bad thing, but 
you want to get in and out of that divot quick and that's what the jp camera will do um, and then coupled with the next slide which showcases the heel and the toe um, if you go to the next picture we'll get that up here And, uh, that's, that's a good looking picture too. but uh, <laughs> the one with the two arrows I don't have that one up we'll get it loaded up here <clears throat> yeah no worry so you have the you have that forward forward camber that we just talked about from that trailing edge to leading edge curvature resists that digging adds consistent turf interaction and then what we want to do in that heel and toe area is we want to remove that excess baggage, so to speak. So you can lay that thing open um, and not have that leading edge rise too much off the ground. That also reduces the, the amount of material or the wedge going through the ground, uh, which creates that less drag, maintains more speed through impact, um, which is going to result in more spin around the greens. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, sorry, we're just getting that image pulled up here for you. But um, I mean, clearly the uh, the, de the attention to detail here on these is 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 truly impressive here. So um, as we get that one pulled up, I just wanted to ask you something about so like your operation today. So um, if I'm understanding this right, you've got a place now in is it San Diego where you're operating and yep. you're building your wedges and everything like that. That's right. Uh, I got in, in San Diego here. I uh, got the. What I call the grind house. And that's kind of uh, all my shops. I call them. The, it's the grind house because ultimately, I started grinding in a garage and a house. So um, uh, I call it the grind house. I got you know all the all the toys I need to ultimately create the these wedges and and then we're uh, assembling, building them, custom building to the clients. Right there, you can see that image. Um, uh, cool image there was is kind of showing that multiple material design uh, that titanium back plate covered with the JP logo and that's it's, it's showing some internal tungsten um, and then that that yellow uh, um, material there is where I can I can custom head weight make custom head weights with a unique injection filling weighting process patent pending as well so pretty excited about all that and then if you look at the right side of that wedge body, you can see that real aggressive heel relief. And then on the, on the right side and on the left side, you'll see that aggressive toe relief. And that really allows you to manipulate the head for the, whatever shot you're looking to do and creates that less drag through the divot, but also in the sand as well. When you open it up, hit that um, green side bunker shot, you have less material um, going through the sand so it maintains more speed mm -hmm. and you can hit all the shots you need to hit. 